All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, joining you as usual from a lovely sunny San Diego. And today I am joined by Brigadier General Tom Kolditz, who is in Rice University in Texas. How are you doing, Tom? I am fabulous as always, John. How are you? Good, good. Or should I call you Brigadier General? I just wanted to say that again. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Fine. <laughs> Um, and so uh, uh, Tom uh, has Saxon uh, Castle Consulting, uh, which works with uh, works with teams to really engage and inspire and, and get them learning how to lead more effectively. And one of the books that Tom wrote that has been very instrumental is a book around what he calls in extremist leadership. Uh, leading as if your life depended on it. And obviously, with your background, Tom, you you know what it's like to lead as if your life depended on it. Uh, but you've been able to parlay that into the business environment. And as you were saying, you were doing a lot of work in when the financial crisis came around. So what are the characteristics of in extremist leadership? Well, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really leadership under circumstances where People believe that the leader is going to influence their physical well-being or their long-term financial well-being. In other words, the stakes are very high. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the principal characteristic of this kind of leadership is that it's, it's mostly about trust and that most of what we see in terms of management tends to be washed away, tends to be uh, less relevant. So, for example, resourcing. Uh, when people are afraid for their lives or their livelihoods, they want out of that situation. They don't care how expensive it might be, what kind of check they might have to write. There's no resource management to it. It's how do we survive? And so there are many relevant lessons from combat. Uh, I've been a, a parachute instructor since 1980. Um, and, and in the, these kinds of circumstances where people are afraid for their lives, right. they consistently want things from their leaders. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what I study. That's what I wrote the book about. And, and that's what I like to, to talk about. So how do you establish that level of trust, right? Uh, as you said, particularly uh, in the situations you've been in where people's lives are literally depending on you. How do you develop that level of trust where somebody goes, okay, I can, I can take a deep breath and calm down because I know Tom has got this handled. So the single most uh, relevant uh, variable to establish that trust is competence. Mm. So often when I talk to business leaders and they're trying to establish levels of trust in their organization, they'll immediately move towards the social. So they'll mm. want to have a golf scrambles or they'll want to have wine and cheese on Thursdays with the employees or they'll, they'll want to do other social things. And that's good when things are going well. But when things are disastrous, the focus of the employees goes right to that individual's competence rather than all that social capital that's been built. And one of the questions that I'm often asked is, well, you know, how do I show this competence? Uh, and I usually try to put leaders at ease and say, look, you're in your role because you bring something to the table. But here's the thing. Many of your decisions and much of your work occurs behind closed doors. People don't see you work. And if they can't see you work, they can't interpret your work as being as competence. So you have to make sure that your employees are in a position to occasionally see you work, to see you walk through decisions, to see you uh, come up with solutions to problems based on your experience and based on your ability. And then uh, they anticipate that you'll be competent in other circumstances. You can also show them your competence in other legitimate and authentic ways, and there'll be a halo effect. Mm -hmm. So if it's an unanticipated crisis, they'll still be confident that you're competent if you've shown them in other ways. Right. But what, what you can't do, uh, and I always warn people against, is try to create a set of circumstances 
that cause you to look good. Uh, that always goes badly for the leader. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, even but, when, when uh, you're in a set of circumstances where you're not performing, you're not leading, to boast about it or mm -hmm. to brag about how competent you are is also very detrimental to people's perception of your quality of leadership and your, and your real competence, your actual competence. Yeah, so, there's, a, there's a lot of things. Let me just cut this up because there's a lot of things to unpack there because I, I, you, you've uh, come up with a lot of great insights here. Um, one of the first ones you, you mentioned about, uh, you know, this idea of you know, trying to build things through social uh, interactions, right? And it seems like over the last number of years, the pendulum has swung very far over there where it's all about... Uh, you know, creating this collegial environment, getting together and wearing the same color t-shirt and all of this kind of stuff that seems, as you say, when a crisis comes around, that stuff counts for very little, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, people, it's, it's funny, I talk to people a lot about crisis and I, I taught the topic at the Yale School of Management. And I would ask students sometimes at the beginning of the, of the course, you know, what, what's a crisis? What's the last crisis you had? And some of them will say things like, well, you know, the copier was out of toner. Uh, and, and so, you know, people don't necessarily have a lot of experience with mm -hmm. desperation, with, with very serious business problems or very serious uh, physical challenges like you would have in law enforcement or the military mm -hmm. and so forth. And so what we have to do is that, that those of us who have experience in those circumstances need to share what's important because uh, unless you're prepared when the crisis begins, it's too late. You know, you can't all of a sudden try to adapt in, in some uh, unfamiliar way to a crisis if you, if you haven't been preparing for it all along. It just doesn't work. Um, so that, then, that's... And then yeah. the other thing you mentioned about the, the closed door, I, I really like that idea about how do you know your leader is competent if you never actually see them in action or you only see the results of their decisions, you don't see the process by which they got there or whatever. So I think that's a key thing for people to pick up on there because I can imagine, and I've been in those positions myself, I'm, I can imagine that a lot of people, you would forget very easily that your process isn't transparent to everyone. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've developed so many technological ways to separate ourselves from our employees and, and the people we lead. And there's often, uh, you know, no, no real substitute for contact. I remember when I was uh, about to command my, my first battalion and I went to a mentor of mine and I said, well, you know, I'm gonna have 800 uh, people working for me I can't, I can't always be with them. How much uh, personal presence do I have to have? And I'll never forget what he said. He, he said, you need to be around them enough so that they know your voice in the dark. And, and that guided me, you know, that I didn't right. have to be there all the time, but they had to know me. You know, they mm -hmm. had to, to have seen me operating and I had to have been physically present with them and so forth. And I think that most business people, if they ask themselves, you know, uh, have I been with my employees enough that they would know my voice in the dark? Right. That's a good standard to have. Yeah, no, that's an excellent, another excellent takeaway. And, and one of the other things, and this, I remember working somewhere many years ago, I won't say where, but uh, the senior management team were, I have to say, when a crisis came along, they just, they flourished right they they bloomed blossomed they were great they could all come together and they could solve a crisis and it was wonderful but we lurched from one crisis to another because they never did the other work to avoid crises so it's not just right about being great at crisis management is it it's about making sure that those crises don't happen if at all possible yeah, and you know, there's there's some very strong uh, techniques for for making that preparation. Um, one of the things I noticed in by being around crises is that there was always someone standing off to the side, 
who said, well, I knew this was going to happen. I saw this coming a mile away. Uh, and you just want to take that person and shake them by the shirt and say, where were you three months ago? Yeah. Uh, and so it's a leader's job to find that person ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And so what I would do uh, with my, my teams is something called a pre-mortem, where mm -hmm. I would bring them in and I'd ask them to describe uh, a huge fiasco for our organization, something that would virtually shut us down, get us all fired, uh, you know, that would be difficult to recover from. And they would anonymously sketch out these horror stories uh, on a piece of paper, and then I would collect them, and I would read them out loud. And in many cases, they started talking about real threats to our organization that not everyone knew about, yeah. but they did. And so the person I was looking for is this person who would be off on the side saying, I, I saw it coming, you know, I warned people, but they wouldn't have warned me as the leader. Yeah. And so you have, to, you have to make every effort to allow people to predict catastrophe in a mm -hmm. safe environment with some anonymity and no threat, and then you have to run it to ground. Uh, and it's everything from, did you know your accountant uh, has a gambling problem? Right. To, uh, you know, other off the wall, crazy things that you would, you would never think of, but often take organizations down. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's find that person that knows about it and that sees it coming. And that's a leader's job. Yeah, and I love that idea of the of the pre of the pre mortem and uh, and the idea of the uh, your accountant with the gambling problem. Yeah, that could land you land any company in hot water for sure. Uh, so um, so when you're when you're when you're in the actual crisis moment and the crisis hits, right? Your your initial job is as a leader, I would presume, is to take the temperature down a bit and start looking at things clearly as opposed to everybody just running crazy. Yeah, absolutely. When we study professional crisis leaders, uh, you know, special operations people and, and uh, FBI SWAT team chiefs and climbing guides and, you know, people that do dangerous work all the time, they're right. very quiet people. Mm -hmm. And so when there's a problem, they get quieter. They don't yell at people or show a lot of emotion. And as leaders, we're, we're paid to calm people down, not to spin people up. And unfortunately, what we see in Hollywood, uh, in movies, is often wrong. The director is trying to excite us. And so they will portray leaders as being very animated in crisis and yelling at people, screaming into a phone or a microphone, and it's all wrong. You know, uh, the people that do this all the time are quiet, humble communicators who put other people at ease. Mm. And, and that's really what we have to do, and that happens by practicing that kind of mindfulness every single day. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. And let's face it, I mean, that is the pervasive culture today is all about getting amped up about everything, it seems. So that idea of taking a, a calm and quiet, collected, intelligent approach, you know, that is something that I think people need to take a, a, a good hard look at and ask themselves, is that how they're leading? Because I think that's a that's an incredibly important piece. Well, you're, you're right, John. And, and you know, uh... Those of us who've been in bad places a lot, mm -hmm. we've, we've learned this about a crisis. It can always get worse. <laughs> and so, so as a leader, if you get upset on the front end of it, you know, your people are immediately thinking, well, what's going to happen if it's worse? You know, what is it, this person's already spun up and angry. <laughs> so what, what happens when the next shoe hits the floor? And, yeah. uh, and so it's best to kind of conserve that. And, put people at ease because they won't solve problems any faster because you yell at them or because you're screaming because you're afraid. 
Yeah. And, and the flip side of that, as you mentioned earlier, is making sure that people can differentiate between what is an actual crisis and what's, uh, you know, maybe a, a mishap or just an inconvenience. Exactly. Exactly. It's often a good idea to say, what's the worst thing that can happen here? Mm -hmm. uh, and if the worst thing is not the destruction of the company or the injury or death of a person, well, now you're in a whole different category of of problem yeah. uh, but if it is those things you know that's when the leader decides he or she is not going to go to sleep for a while right well you know thankfully in 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 the jobs that most of us do uh, you know they're not life and death and that's what i tend to say to people when something happens and when everybody gets worked up i say okay let's just take a step back right the good thing is nobody died and nobody's going to die as a result of this let's just figure out the solution. That's true, but you know, the these same principles apply as as powerfully in our personal lives as they do mm -hmm. our professional lives. And when I poll poll my audiences and I ask them, how many of you have been in an organization that's had a death? How many of you have had to respond to a, a medical emergency in your family? Uh, how many of you are having a crisis right now? Mm -hmm. I get about. 50% of my audiences that say they're in a personal or professional crisis right then. And it's important for leaders to understand when they're working with their people and they're looking to their right and their left, probably a third to a half of the room is under tremendous pressure for some reason that the leader may not even be aware of. Yeah, that's 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 an that's an incredibly powerful point. Uh, yeah, I never thought of that, but that is that's uh, that's definitely uh, that's definitely something to take on board. And then one last thing, uh, you know, getting back to how to avoid this or to make sure that when a crisis does come, that you're best prepared. Obviously, in the military, I've never been in the military, but I I know enough about it to know that you are scenario planning constantly, right? That's that is, uh, and for all eventualities and. And getting back to your point earlier, that's something that companies should take time out to do as well as to scenario plan. Exactly. But you know, um, the plan is just to orient people to the potential for a, cr a crisis. We have a saying in the military that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Yeah, I can and see it's that. The same in a competitive business environment, you know, there. There, there are people who don't want you to succeed out there mm -hmm. and they get a vote, you know, they can do things, they can take action. So uh, I prefer actually, rather than a lot of planning, to make sure that every individual in the organization understands the leader's intent. What's behind the plan? So they right. have to know the purpose. They have to know the desired end state. They have to know any tasks that are non-negotiable and must be completed. And then the leader also needs to make clear what he or she does not want to have happen. If people know those four things, they're, they're positioned to take initiative in crisis and respond to change without having to change a plan or yeah. you know, reissue a plan. But if they don't know one of those things, purpose, methods, end state, risk, then, then they're not in a position to take initiative and they'll wait, you know, they'll wait for further guidance or for a second plan. And that's a disaster. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the things about crisis is that in order to defeat it, you have to be fast and agile. And right. uh, what gets you there is not prior planning as much as it is making clear what the intent is so that people can make things up as they go. Mm -hmm. And obviously they can do that if you've trained them well, right? And if you've made sure that they have the right skill sets to, to do their job and to be able to show and to be able to take initiative. Yeah, sure. And if they trust you, which is where we started with this conversation, yep. then they're going to have the confidence to take initiative on your behalf. But if you've been a yeller and a screamer, or they think that you're not competent, they're just going to wait and watch the train wreck happen. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to make sure that it's your name behind all the decisions, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, listen, 
this is Tom. This is a great, great place to end. Uh, I want to thank you for today. Before we go, uh, if you'd share a little bit, more, little bit more about yourself and how people can learn more about you and what you do. Well, yes, I'm very easy to find. I work at Rice University in Houston, Texas, uh, and I run the most comprehensive leader development program at any university. It's called the Anne and John Doerr Institute for New Leaders. Uh, we offer a professional leadership coach to every student in the university who wants it. Uh, and, and we work uh, with about 40% of the Rice student body. Right. So thomas.coldits at rice.edu, very easy to find. Excellent. Well, thanks again, uh, Tom. This has been fascinating. And I hope uh, everybody out there took notes and uh, are well prepared for their next crisis. Let's face it, you're probably going to have one, hopefully a minor one only. But uh, it, they're almost inevitable that you're going to have experience one or two in your business uh, career uh, and maybe in your life in, in general. So it's good to get uh, insights and advice on how to how to approach them. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.